so I'm being recorded, so I have to watch what I say. Um, I'm not going to use the mic. I'm going to ask you guys to maybe get closer since there isn't a ton of people here. Um, I'm pretty loud generally, so it shouldn't be an issue hearing me. Um, and I'd rather have this more of an interactive session than, than me lecturing to you, because I'm sure that that's all you guys have to go through every single day. So it's the last thing you want to have to go through at almost, what, 7.30 at night? Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, tonight's t the title of tonight's talk is The Woman in Islam. Um, and when I read it, I was like, is it the women in Islam, or did they spell it wrong, or, you know, because I always mix up women and women, but I realized it was the woman in Islam. Um, and before we go into that, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit further and talk a little bit more about what MPAC does, specifically the Young Leaders Program, because all of you guys meet the requirements of what it means to be a part of our Young Leaders Program, and I think that, I hope that a lot of you are interested in the industries that we, um, kind of take part in and uh, try to connect with and try to provide opportunities and resources for young young Muslim Americans or American Muslims to be a part of those those opportunities in those industries. So like Adham said, my name is Yasmin Hussein. Um, I am not that much older than you, so it feels good to be kind of within my age range, sort of. Um, today actually marks my two-year anniversary with MPAC, so that was really exciting to be here because I'm doing exactly what I enjoy doing, which is connecting with young Muslim Americans and obviously other individuals of other faiths um, because we do interfaith work as well. Um, I'm originally from South Florida. Uh, that's where I grew up, and I moved to D.C. two years ago, and I've been working with MPAC since then. Um, I went to Florida Atlantic University, it's a state university, um, and I did my undergraduate degree and um, finished up my master's coursework and I taught public speaking and interpersonal communication there. Um, and I'm finishing my thesis currently, inshallah, it's been a very long time since I started it. So advice to anyone who goes into a master's program, finish your thesis before you take on a full-time job because it will take you like forever to try to actually finish a thesis. Um, and then um, through there, I was very active with the MSA. I was the treasurer of MSA National. I was also the director of the, um, of the Community Service Task Force, or not the director, the chair of the Community Service Task Force, um, which started Project Downtown, if some of you guys are familiar with that project. It actually started from Miami. Uh, a few of my friends are the ones who started that project and then got adopted by MSA National and now is a part of, um, what's that group? That does... Uh, stuff across the world. Um, anyways, it will hit me. Um, they're like Islamic Relief, but by, oh, Muslims Without Borders. Uh, anyways, yeah. So Muslims Without Borders now kind of runs Project Downtown. Um, just some cool things, I guess, I'm really happy that I got to take part of um, uh, through MPAC. Uh, last year, actually exactly a year ago, I was... Um, awarded a grant through the State Department to travel to Bulgaria and Bosnia to speak to Muslim communities there. It's really interesting to see how the Muslim communities are in, um, in Europe specifically. Um, and Bulgaria and Bosnia are like complete opposites in terms of the way Muslims are integrated in one country and how they're isolated in another, which the isolation is taking place in Bulgaria. Um, and, um, and so that was an awesome experience that I got to take part in. And I've been kind of traveling around the country speaking to MSAs, to college students, to young people on issues of student activism, the importance of being involved civically, the importance of kind of f fulfilling and pursuing the dreams that you have, even if they're kind of taboo areas um, to a lot of our ethnic backgrounds. So like Hollywood, um, MPAC actually really promotes a, a great opportunities in Hollywood for young Muslim Americans who want to be a part of that industry whether it's as actors or um, directors or filmmakers or you know editors, there's so many opportunities within that industry that don't conflict with Islam, and so we show you what those opportunities are. We also have a summit, and uh, one of our focus areas is media, um, and that's another taboo kind of uh, uh, industry because a lot of our parents will always complain about how Muslims are portrayed, and will complain as well, I'm not gonna pretend that we don't as well, about how Muslims are portrayed in the media. Um, so. We take young people to New York, um, and by young people I mean people your age, um, to New York and, and expose them to that industry and the opportunities within it. 
Um, and then there's um, the government summit, which Edham got to be a part of in 2011. And um, through that, we show you, again, opportunities you can take part in in the government summit uh, or in government arena, uh, whether it's through you know federal agencies, through the nonprofit sector, the Hill, different different aspects. And then our latest summit, which is exciting, we're in the process of developing it right now, is called the Silicon Valley Summit. So um, we're working on the programming for that. And it should be taking place in March, inshallah, in San Francisco, or in Silicon Valley. Um, again, exposing young, Mus young Muslims who are interested in going into business or technology um, or entrepreneurship and kind of showing them how they can practice their faith or implement their faith within that industry. So that's kind of an overview of what I do at MPAC. Beyond that, I also run the internship program and the fellowship program. Um, and I also work on the women's rights issues or issues regarding women and young girls. And so um, thank you so much for inviting me. I promise I won't be lecturing. It's going to be interactive, especially since we're an intimate group, which is really exciting. Um, and just to start off, I'm not a scholar, Islamic scholar. So um, please don't ask me questions about what the Quran says about certain things, because I won't really know the answers to them. Um, I can make a promise to go back and Con consult a scholar and get back to you on the answer, but I'm, I'm not a scholar. Um, I would consider myself an activist, if anything. Um, so I'll try to answer things from the best of my knowledge, but also kind of give it to you from the perspective of a Muslim woman who lives in the U.S. So, um, so yeah. So I actually kind of structured my talk today for a crowd that would pre be predominantly of other faiths. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of... Uh, fix it as we go along since I'm seeing that the majority of you, unless you're just wearing hijab for hijab day, <laughs> um, I'm assuming that the majority of people in here are of the Muslim faith and that, or of the Islamic faith, and then I'm not sure if anyone else is of other faiths, you don't have to say you are. But I'm hoping that the conversation will be beneficial to everyone. So I want everyone to kind of take a second, because I'm sure you had a really long day, and think about the first word that comes to mind when you think of Muslim woman. And whoever wants to blurt it out can go ahead and do that. Severely oppressed. Okay. That's two words. That is two words. So why don't we just go with the word oppressed? What else? I'm sorry? Covered. Covered, okay. What else? Inferior. I'm sorry? Inferior. Inferior, okay. Do you have a word? Oh, okay. <laughs> Empowered. Okay, we have a positive one there. What else? Okay, so maybe afraid. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Two more people. I know you guys have it in you. Protect, protector. Okay. Of like, their. Of like their homes and stuff. Okay. Protected. Protected. Sheltered. Okay. I'll do sheltered. Did someone else over here have their hand up for a second? No? Okay. So as you can see, the majority of words that were blurted by the group were things that kind of seem like we what we would call misconceptions, correct? Um, because I can say for, for me... Um, I'm definitely not afraid. <laughs> I'm not oppressed by anyone. Um, I happen to be covered, but that's by choice. And um, we can talk a little bit about that later, um, about the hijab and, and kind of the, the different um, approaches and opinions behind it, because it's important for us to acknowledge that there are different approaches to it um, for people who, who wear it and for those who don't. Um, I'm kind of, I don't consider myself beneath un anyone. Um, I would say I do feel empowered at many times, um, and 
I was sheltered growing up, but that had nothing to do with Islam. It had to do with my Egyptian background <laughs> and my Egyptian family. So other than that, um, these, these, these words, unfortunately, are the, a lot of them are what society feels Muslim women are. And so there's something that's going wrong, right? And um, what I want to kind of have this discussion take place is what I like to call the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and, and there's the good, the bad, and the ugly in the Muslim community, but there's the good, the bad, and the ugly about Muslim women. And so let's talk about what those things are. A lot of these words or these, these concepts, where are they coming from? Why are people feeling this way? Movies. Movies? Okay. Media. The media. But so you're absolutely correct. But from from where are they? Are they just made up things, or are they current? Are they actually like? Do they exist within? I think, I think that like there are people who are, who are not Muslim, who may have gone to other countries and seen, or you can say they're in their own country mm -hmm. and seen, you know, a man being hard on his wife, or whatever, doing something bad to her, mm -hmm. and 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 then at the same time, there's kind of like a statement in Western society. Or women, you know, they cover themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think what it is, is it is, you know, someone or other people, you know, I guess took that one instant or that isolated thing mm -hmm. of someone doing something negative to a woman and just assuming that all of the women are treated that way and they're mm -hmm. being discriminated. Okay. Or, and then also, um, also, um, uh, I don't know the word, but bad things sell you know, bring more audiences. So okay. Someone wants to hear, oh, Muslim women are just like everyone else, they're highly educated. Okay. They want to see something negative with this Okay. Oh. Oh, sure. No, no, I don't mind. Okay. Is this a little bit better? Possibly? Yeah, it's on. It's not better? Okay. Let's try this one. What's on? Is this better? Okay. Cool. Okay. So, media, Hollywood. In the back? Uh, um, there may even be certain factions within the Islamic world itself that um, wants to perpetuate certain, mm -hmm. uh, you want to call them stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, it fits into their own um, ideology, um, um, whether it be um, political or theological or, or Okay. So let's talk about that for a second. I think um, for a basis, let's kind of do uh, vocabulary 101. Um, unfortunately, sometimes people say Islam promotes you know, oppression towards women. Uh, women. Islam promotes, um, you know, violence towards women. Islam doesn't allow women to get an education. Islam forces women to cover. Islam, um, you know, forces women to marry men that they don't want to marry. Islam, Islam, Islam. But when you open the Quran and when you open the Sirah or the teachings of the Prophet and like look at his life, Islam didn't really teach any of these practices. So it's important to identify that Islam as a religion teaches us our practices, but we as Muslims are the ones who decide whether or not to practice it appropriately. So unfortunately, like you said, there are individuals, there are communities, there are people, and there are a lot of them. We're not going to sit here and pretend that it's not, that domestic abuse doesn't happen in the Muslim community. It, we would be lying to ourselves if we said, Muslims don't hit their wives. Muslims, Muslim men don't hit their children. Like, this stuff does happen. This stuff happens in this country. And it's important for us to acknowledge that it exists. It's important for us to acknowledge that it exists so that we can work on it, so that we can fix it, so that we can ensure that it doesn't happen to a lot of you young girls who one day will get married and be, you know, in a relationship and that your relationship isn't something that is, you know, abusive. But does Islam teach, you, teach men or women to abuse their spouse. No. Um, go ahead.
like Muslims themselves don't really understand the difference between their culture and then Islam, and so they practice certain things, or they behave in a certain way and call it Islam, and then us Muslims can even understand the difference between culture and Islam. We cannot expect non-Muslims to reject their person's perspective to understand that what how they're behaving is something. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you on that concept, but um, it's been, that excuse has been used so often that it's culture, it's culture. And, and I wouldn't say culture allows you to shoot a 14-year-old girl who promotes education. Uh, no, 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 I'm not, I know I'm not saying you're not saying that, but what I'm, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we have to stop almost giving it an excuse and start calling it for what it is, that there are people within the community, within every community, but, but, but we're focused right now on our own community. It's important for us to recognize that there are problems, right? There are issues that are occurring within our community and they need to be addressed. That's the bad. That's the ugly. The ugly is a man who shoots a 14-year-old girl and calls that protecting Islam. It happens, right? Like this stuff is happening. The news isn't making it up. Like it's actually occurring. So how are we addressing it? Like an, the average American should be able to turn on the TV, see that news story and recognize that that person's crazy and that person doesn't is not an example of Islam. But unfortunately, that's not what's occurring. I mean, working, I'm telling you, working within, an, within a Muslim organization for the past two years alone and that beyond that, the MSA national kind of scene and kind of seeing how people perceive Islam and perceive Muslims, it's really bad out there. And we have to work on the perception. But the problem is we're never going to work on the perception of anything beyond just women, but the perception of Islam and Muslims until we fix the problems that are within. That's like, uh, you know, that's like the very basic level. So, alhamdulillah, like you guys are all here getting an education, right? Your parents are promoting for you to get an education. So this concept of education or being scared to get an education is something we can't relate to. Girls in, you know, in the northern frontier of Pakistan are fearful of getting an education because things like that happen to them for, for wanting to get that. We have, to, we have to address those issues and kind of be honest with ourselves that that it's kind of occurring. So I think that this, as, how do I say it? The second we acknowledge that it's existing, any kind of problem that we're having within our community, we'll be able to then say, okay, now let's have open dialogues about them. Like, when was the last time you went to your mosque and you talked about an addiction to pornography? I know that that's like a really abrupt thing to kind of throw in your face, but when was the last time that a mosque put on an event talking about that? This is a problem within the Muslim American community. And very rarely is it discussed. So the problem that is existing is that we're not having conversations. And until we have conversations, the perception, perceptions people will have of the Muslim American community will always be the way it is until we fix certain things from within. We're not going to sit here, like for example, I'm not going to sit here and... Um, I'm not going to apologize, for example, for someone committing a terrorist attack. I don't identify with that person. Right? Like, you know that Islam doesn't promote that. You know that that's not the teachings that you had. So, I know we're kind of going on a tangent, but, like, do you get the concept of, of, of what I'm trying to get to? So, for, for the majority of the group to, to kind of say negative things about the way women are perceived, there's, there's a problem, right? There's, there's a disconnect between the Muslim community and between the general society for people to still have those perceptions. And even for Muslims to feel like those are the perceptions that people have of them. Right? So, does that make sense? Are there any other things that anyone wanted to kind of express in terms of the ugly part? Um, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I feel like, um, well, number one, the women of Islam stand out, obviously. You know, I mean, unless she's just not wearing the job, they all stand out. Mm -hmm. Whereas the men don't really stand out much. You know, they just look like normal people. So, so something else like that, I think like certain, you know, people have their own um, things that they like to do as far as like religious things that they will and will not do. And so some women won't talk to a man, obviously, won't talk to a man, period, point blank. And that's just their personal thing that they like to do. Some men, you know, will not look at a woman when they walk by. But see, it's more noticeable. The women are, are, are basically the ones that stand out when it comes to Islam. And I think that, like, I think something that a lot of people, I, I 
guess that will make it negative or whatever because they'll see a woman walking by who has her head covered or whatever and they're too um, intimidated to go up and say something. No one wants to come in and ask you a question because they think, oh, well, she'll be saying God you know, and it's no, no one has an issue with a man and asking you a question but they don't, but the men don't stand out. Mm-hmm. But that, but isn't that putting a lot of weight on Muslim women who do decide to wear the hijab? Right. Well, okay. So I'm sorry. I'm not. No, no, no. I'm not saying. I mean, that you're, what you're saying is absolutely true. Right. Like that. Those I are the mean, the realities. I guess. I guess the thing is because because you guys stand out, and, and it's not I me. Mean, you stand out. Mm-hmm. So I think that maybe you know it's it's twofold. Like it's everyone's problem. People should be intimidated. People should be comfortable coming up and asking questions if they want to ask questions. Mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, and I'm sure, like, I, I wouldn't want somebody coming up asking me a question every time they saw me, that's question. But I think that maybe there has to be a change in, in the culture or whatever, whereas everyone, the women and the men, are, are more open, more like, let me talk to you about my religion, mm-hmm. my faith. Because I don't know, for me, as an outsider, as someone who was on the outside of the end, no one came up to me and said, hey, how's it going? I'm a Muslim. Let me tell you about this one. Christians do that all the time. Yeah, and, okay. So, that, I guess that's kind of like the thing. It just seems so, so like, standoffish mm-hmm. from other people. Yeah, so... I have a philosophy. This is my own personal philosophy that doesn't represent any organization or any, doesn't represent necessarily like anything. I believe in something called silent dawah. And, and dawah is basically kind of like, um, it's like, you know, telling people about Islam, educating them about Islam. I don't believe in forcing, my, forcing myself onto someone and being like, hey, I'm Muslim, I'm going to tell you everything about Islam. Because that's, that, to me, is a total turnoff. Like, that's, that would turn anyone off on wanting to learn about their religion. However, if someone ever came up to me and was like, I just wanted to ask you a question about, you know, Islam. Like, today on the airplane, when I was flying from D.C. here to, when I flew into Chicago, the lady next to me saw my bracelets and she asked me if they're from India. I said, no, actually, they're from Forever 21. She's like, oh, they look like they're from India. I'm like, yeah, I guess the U.S. is really picking up on copying styles from that part of the region. And then eventually it led to the, the, the discussion of hijab. And I think that was her way of breaking into, like, let me relate to her on bracelets. And then let me ta- ask her about hijab. And she asked me, how do you wear it? And then when we got into the bathroom, I took off my hijab. And I showed her how I put it on. And, like, I was able to connect with her. And it didn't take two seconds. And now she can walk away and say, hey, she's not scary. She, you know, she speaks English because unfortunately a lot of people feel like you just, you don't even speak English. And even if you don't speak English, that doesn't make you a bad person. Like, that's just a language barrier. It's, it's not something in your hands. Um, and, and you're relatable. Like, I shop at Forever 21. I'm a normal American girl, you know, or young woman. <laughs> I'm not a girl anymore, unfortunately. Um, no. I miss saying that I was a teenager as well. But anyways, that's my own problem. Um, uh, so, you know, making yourself relatable. I agree with you 100% on being relatable. I agree with you 100% on being approachable. And that's something, again, talking about, so we talked about the ugly, and the ugly are, you know, these crazy things that are happening around the world, not just in parts of Muslim-majority countries. And by the way, I like to call, like, at MPAC, we like to call it Muslim-majority countries, not Muslim countries, because they're not necessarily Muslim countries. They just, the majority of people that live there are Muslim. Um, and they're not, it's not the Islamic world, because that's a, like a really broad, broad, you know, like broad brush to kind of paint. It's just, you know, Muslim majority countries. It is what it is. It's just the majority of people that live in those specific countries happen to be Muslim. Um, anyways, but that's just, you know, a way of putting it. But, um, but the things that are happening are not just happening there, they're happening here in the U.S. Um, you know, we've had ugly things happen in the U.S., when it comes to women. I'm not going to talk about terrorist-related cases. And when I made that comment about not apologizing, it's one thing to not... And when I, what I meant by that, just to clarify, is that I consider that so crazy that I can't relate to it, if that makes sense. Like, it's so far away from what my religion teaches that I don't consider it... I don't consider a person like that a part of what I believe. 
Um, but with that said, because these people are using Islam as their motive with whatever they're doing, it's important that Muslim Americans are coming out and condemning things. And you'll see time and time again, Muslim organization after Muslim organization after Muslim organization condemning every single thing that happens. And you still hear people complaining where the Muslim voice is. And that's where you can say, well, you know something? We're having these press conferences, we're having these press releases out and no media is showing up, no media is coming out. So there's only so much you can do as an organization to get out there. You had these ads that, that went up in the New York, uh, New York City uh, subways, um, and they're you know, equating normal human beings to savages, which is absolutely offensive, and you're having Muslim organizations or Islamic organizations come out against them, including my own organization that's having its own ad printed out in D.C. because this ad now is now went from New York and is now coming to Washington, D.C. and is in some of the major um, metro stations where they're most populated in terms of people who go through them. And so it's about having those voices out there, ensuring that you're, you're spreading messages of peace. And the, another thing is combating the ugly stuff that's out there with messages of peace, with messages of love, not fighting, right? Like, Someone says something horrible about me, I'm going to say something horrible about you. And, it, and it's just like this cycle. So it's about spreading this message of peace, this love that the prophet taught us. And this is who's being ridiculed so often is the prophet. And it's like, man, just read about his life. He's so cool. Like, everything about him is so awesome. Like, and, and, and you wish people understood why you love him so much as a Muslim and because of the beautiful stories you heard about his life. And you want to share that with people, but you can't share that if you're being, you know, if you're being aggressive about it, right? And so that's where I would only argue with you that um, I would say to anyone who's of another faith, walk up to a Muslim. Like if you see someone who's wearing a scarf or not wearing a scarf or has a beard or doesn't have a beard and you happen to think they're Muslim, or maybe they're wearing a pin that says, I'm Muslim, walk up to them and ask them a question. And you know, if they don't answer it or if they're rude or mean, they're not doing a real good job. It's that simple. But I wouldn't, wa I wouldn't like to see Muslims walking around and saying, here's a pamphlet about Islam, go read about it. Or here's a Quran. Like that's the worst thing you can do is hand someone a Quran and say, go read it. Because that, for some people, it works. For some people, it's like, what on earth am I reading? Like they need guidance. As an average Muslim, I can tell you, I can pick up the Quran and I'm like lost. Because you need someone to help you and guide you and put these stories into context. Because that's what it is. So much of what's misunderstood about Islam is because it's taken out of context. And you're not seeing what's behind it. So we've talked about the bad and the ugly stuff. I think we're good with that, right? We have one more? Okay. What was your name? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Why don't we introduce ourselves? So what was your name? Michael. Thank you for participating. Ahmed. Okay. Right. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And so um, that was actually, I was going to talk about that in the good side. No, I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to talk about that in the good side, about how many cool rights we have over you guys. And you don't even know it. So, um, so actually, Muslim women, um, that's the ironic part, is that even when it talks about the, cre like the creation of mankind, it, it talks about how they were paired as equals, Adam and Eve. Like it started off in terms of e equality, right? And everything was equal. Even when the tribes began to expand, everything was so equal. So the, the, the history of mankind in Islam, at least, started off on a very equal note. And then, then you came to like when Islam was you know, developed and the stories of the Prophet came out and the, and the different ayahs were sent, like the different verses from the Quran were sent down, you saw these rights that were beginning you know, to, to come down in terms of inheritance, in terms of, in terms of duties at home, in terms, of, in terms of like married couples, in terms of your responsibility towards your mother. I mean, this is, how many times have you heard your mom said, say, what? No, my mom didn't say that to me. <laughs> she said, "Your mother, your mother, your mother, then your father." And that's 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 a, like that's a well-known um, like uh, teaching in Islam that your mother comes three times before your father. And then this may be TMI, but 
even, and TMI means too much information for those, I just found that out actually recently, this is where you really feel like you're disconnected from the world, um, but, um, you know, even when, like, your mom asks you to massage her feet, or, like, help, you know, massage her back, or something like that, she's like, you know, heaven is under my feet, like, you better get working, you know what I mean? And, like, I'm like, oh, that's disgusting, okay, you know, but, like, you know, but this is, this is the, this is, this is the place of women in Islam. You know, the mother, like a mother is so revered in a way that is, it's just like not, you know, cons you know, you can't even put it into, into understanding how much a woman is, in terms of the mothers, are respected. And even with Muslim women in general, you have this misconception of Muslim women being forced into marriages. And that is where, who said culture? What was your name? What was it? Neela Fert. Culture, that's where culture comes in. You do have cultures that really pressure young women into marrying people that they don't want. But show me where in Islam does it say that. I mean, we look at the story of Aisha. You know, she was not forced into a marriage with the Prophet. I mean, actually, from the time she got married to the time she actually, you know, ended up being with the Prophet, there were several years in between. And there are example after example. Khadija, talk about like total G status, she's the one who went to the prophet and said, hey, Mary, you know, I want you to marry me. That's pretty cool. How many of us would do that? None, right? <laughs> so, so the point being is that, like, you know, this is, this, is, this is the reality of what Islam is in terms of where women stand. And so, again, there's a disconnect between why people think that we're not equal to men and what really is the reality. And a lot of it has to do with culture, like you said. A lot of it has to do with those misunderstandings of what culture promotes. You have, you know, um, a lot of things that are practiced in villages, in areas that are more remote, that, in areas that are, you know, unfortunately education is not that much of a priority. So you see that. Um, again, coming from an Egyptian household, education was not an option. Like it was not an option, and if you didn't get straight A's, that was a problem. Like you had to, you you had to get an education, and getting a bachelor's was not enough. And like, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I didn't have the type of parents who told me that I have to be a doctor or an engineer. Like I was, you know, I was free to do what I wanted. But the the concept of education was a very important concept. And for some people, that's a reality, right? Like you have you have to kind of appease your parents. They want you to be something that you don't want to be. And inshallah, like. I mean, we can talk about that later because probably your parents won't like me if I tell you what my opinion on that is. But like, the point being is that you have to um, have to recognize it for what it is. Um, kind of to share like a personal story with you. Um, my father passed away when I was 14, and it's just uh, we're small family: my mother, my sister, and I. And um, when he passed away. My mom obviously had to take care of two girls on her own. If she didn't have the education she had, and if she didn't already work, because she was working prior to my father passing away, it would have, it would have been very difficult for her to kind of take on this responsibility of, of running a household in terms of financially on her own. Um, and even despite that, with a full-time job as a principal of an Islamic school, uh, which you can only imagine how much craziness goes on with that, she decided to do her master's to get even a higher education so that she can better enrich herself. Not because she was going to get paid more, because we all know when you work with Muslim organizations, having any higher degree doesn't really make a difference. Don't s stop recording. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but like, but you know, but the reality is, like, of course, Muslim organizations, unfortunately, our our funding is limited. But my point is, is that. Education was seen as something as enriching. She wanted to stimulate her mind. She wanted to keep herself going, so she continued with that. And, you know, I went through college, undergrad, and, and graduate school without having a father there and, and, you know, having that kind of system and, and took the decision to, like, leave my household to move to D.C. That's not easy, you know, to try to convince your parents that you want or your parent that you want to leave. But because, again, she respected how much it was important for for me to kind of pursue what my dreams are, pursue my like my career trajectory. And now when I call her and I'm like, hey, I'm going to the White House tomorrow because President Obama's hosting uh, the Prime Minister of England, I think it was, and this was earlier this year. And so we got to go to the White House lawn and they had this whole boring ceremony, but it was really cool. And she, you know, she got excited. And so for me, having that support meant so much. And I think it's that's another thing is like the daughter mother relationship is so important in Islam and like making sure that that relationship is strong because um, 
having that support, I think, from our parents means a lot to us, right? Like, you know, knowing that they're supportive of what we do and supportive of the decisions we make and, um, and that they trust us, you know, those are, those are really important things. But anyways, that was just, like, a personal story to kind of explain to you, like, here's an example of a Muslim household that functions very normal. I mean, what I assume as normal, as normal as normal can get. Um, and, you know, education is really important in my family. Um, and even for my family that doesn't live in the U.S., that lives in Egypt, it's not an option. But again, keeping in mind a lot of people in those regions who are not educated has to do with poverty. It doesn't have to do with necessarily um, with choice. Um, so we, I think we're good with the bad now, right? Okay, so then there's the good. Um, and hopefully... We'll, we have a half an hour, but I'm going to stop in like five minutes. Um, in terms of the good, there are so many examples of strong, independent, you know, really successful Muslim women out there. And actually, I don't like using the word independent because it gives you this perception that Muslim women just like don't need anybody. And that's not, you know, that's not necessarily the case. Like we, we still, you know, most of us still want to get married, still want to have children, still want to have that life. And some don't, and that's the choice that they take. So in terms of really great examples of Muslim women out there, you have someone like Dalia Mugahed, who um, is a researcher for Gallup and was nominated by the president or um, brought on as a presidential, um, what's the word, uh, presidential appointee to be a representative of Muslim communities. And she happens to also wear hijab. And also on the note of hijab, I wanted to point out because I think it's important, I, I wear hijab. I actually started wearing hijab when I was 10 years old, and at the time, my parents didn't want me to because they said, you're too young, and they actually happened to come from families that didn't necessarily practice as they were growing up. So both my parents weren't practicing growing up, and they became practicing when they moved to the U.S., actually became very practicing when they moved to the U.S., which is really insane because when they went back to Egypt to visit their family, people were really confused as to what happened. So like, oh, you go to the U.S., and you become you know, religious or conservative or practicing, and then you come back and... So anyways, they were really against, against me wearing the hijab because they felt like I was too young, I didn't need to Islamically at the time, it wasn't what we would deem as, you know, this is your time to kind of wear it, and um, I, I, I moved forward with it anyways. So I've been wearing hijab for a very long time, but with all that said, I think it's important as someone who does wear hijab to recognize that Sometimes those who don't wear hijab feel very isolated from the Muslim community. They feel like they're being judged. They feel like they're not necessarily as respected or they're not seen, at, they're not seen as practicing. I mean, some of my friends who don't wear hijab are some of the most practicing Muslims I happen to know. And I think it's really important for us as women, Muslim women who do wear the hijab, to be fair and to be nice and to, be, um, and to acknowledge that Islam is practiced by people in different ways. Whether or not you agree with whether it is fard or not fard, or it's, some people believe it's sunnah, like everyone has their own opinion, right? And what, whatever your opinion happens to be, and fard, I'm sorry, fard means like it's obliga uh, obligatory on you to do it, or that it's just um, like if you do it, you could get like more good deeds, but if you don't do it, you're not going to get you know, bad deeds for it. Um, and then, um, or whether or not it's even like, part of the religion. Like, there are a lot of opinions out there in terms of what it is. And I didn't discover these opinions until much later in life. And, and what I mean by that is that I always just thought everyone does it. Like, that's the way I grew up in a community that, that was very normal, that girls just started wearing hijab. And I'm very thankful that I wear it. But that's to me, right? Like, it works for me. But for some other girls, it doesn't. And so I think it's really important for us to be inclusive. I think that's the word that I want, I'm looking for, is being inclusive with with people of all kind of practices. So there's that concept. Um, and, and also recognizing that Muslim women are beyond the scarf. There, there are tons of them who don't wear it and are very good Muslim women who like really have amazing positions in society, whether as doctors or as government officials or as you know, engineers or architects or whatever you know, they are. There are so many of them and they're kind of sometimes like shifted to the side because we only look for the ones who are wearing a scarf when we're forgetting there are so many who don't and they're in great positions in life. So just recognizing them as well. So I think we covered a lot today. We talked about the ugly. We talked about 
the good, we talked about the bad, we talked about the misconceptions and how cultural practices and baggage unfortunately like falls into a lot of that. And we talked about a little bit about the contributions. And so Dani Mugahid was one example. There are tons of other examples. My coworker Adina Lekovich is the director of programming and policy at MPAC. Um, during nine like after nine eleven and during the the Park fifty one in New York, the, the community center that was called the Ground Zero Mosque, her face was all over the news. And she also happens to wear hijab. And she's of a Bosnian background. And so she looks very, very fair with like blue eyes. And for the average you know, viewer, they're confused as to why, who she is or how she's Muslim because they have this conception of Muslim. So the point being is that there's so many great examples of Muslim women out there. A lot of us had professors that were Muslim women. Um, a lot of us had, you know, teachers that were Muslim women. Our doctors happened to be Muslim women. You know, education, alhamdulillah, in the U.S., actually Muslim Americans are uh, one of the most educated groups or religious groups in the country. We have the highest levels of education in the U.S., um, as well as employment. So the problem, alhamdulillah, doesn't... There, I mean, there are problems here, but they're not as as big as they are in other parts of the world. So we're doing something right. But one thing that I would, con I would urge for all of you, and this doesn't necessarily just have to deal with Muslim women, but our relationships with our parents, our relationships with our communities, our relationships with our mosques and imams, is have conversations. Talk about those hot button issues that people are scared to talk about. The community centers are supposed to be spaces where you can come in and talk about things that you're... That, that are on your mind, and even if it's like putting something anonymously, like you don't have to say it's you who wants that discussion to take place, but that's the obligation of the community centers to you. They're supposed to be spaces that you feel welcomed in, whether you wear hijab or you don't wear hijab, whether you have a beard on your face or you don't, whether you roll up your pants when you walk into the masjid or you don't, whether you wear a kufi or you don't, like these community centers are supposed to be spaces that cater to you. So it's important that you are constantly engaging the community centers, your MSAs, your, you know, your, your student groups, and ensuring that those conversations are taking place. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Um, if you have any questions about anything, not necessarily related to the topic, you're more than welcome to ask them. Anybody? Sure, go ahead. No, I'm wearing one, but the bottom piece is like this, I guess what would be almost like a, a sock that's sock that doesn't have an end of it. It's not a sock, it's a bandana. There you go. But it's not a bandana. It doesn't, I mean, yeah, it's, the concept is a bandana. I don't know why I said a sock. Um, that was a stupid example. Uh, but yeah, it's just to, <laughs> this is like, sorry brothers, it's just to help, uh, help with the scarf not slipping off and kind of keeping your hair sort of tamed under there. So, yeah. Differently. Oh yeah, yeah, sometimes I wear it, sometimes I don't, sometimes I wear it to the back, sometimes I don't, sometimes I wear, you know, it, it just it depends on what my mood is every morning. Some people take it, like some people take the, the way you wear it kind of uh, uniform, like, like they'll just wear it one way. Um, I happen to come from a, like my cultural background and, and where my family is from Egypt. They're very um, expressive with their scarves. People have beehives literally in their scarves. I mean, not literally, but almost looks like literally in their scarves with a lot of stuff going on. I mean, that's a little bit too much for me. But, um, but the point being is that they get very stylish. And my motto is, why not? Like, if you want to be expressive with it, as long as you're being appropriate, do your thing. Who, like, you know, like, a lot of people are judgmental about that, by the way, but I, I don't see what the issue is. So, um, so yeah, I think it's more of an aesthetic thing, like, you know, just your personal style. Um, but some women, I mean, there are some cultural groups that will wear a specific way. Like you may have our South Asian friends who may wear a little bit to the back, uh, show some ears. Um, you know, you'll tend to see African American women wrap it to the back, or African women wrap it to the back. That that comes from cultural things. So a lot of it also has to do with culture. No problem. Anything else? Questions? Comments? 
Adam? So, okay. Again, the, the concept of hijab obviously is personal, very personal to every person. And I don't think there is one universal answer as to why a person decides to wear the hijab. I think when I wore it, quite honestly, at the age of 10, um, my intentions were pure as, a, as pure as a 10-year-old's intentions could be. Um, but for me, I remember looking at my, my good friend's older sister's who wore it, and I was like, I want to be like them, you know, and I see, saw them as like, you know, I saw them as role models to me, so that was kind of my intentions going into it, um, but obviously as you grow up and you read more on it and you experience life and you go through traumatizing experiences with the hijab and you go through great experiences where you feel like, you know, someone can ask you a question about bracelets and it turns into a whole conversation about hijab. Like, those are those moments where I'm like, oh, that's great. Like, I'm glad that, like, I was able to have that conversation. She might not have necessarily had that conversation with me, but that's just personally me. Um, I think, um, I, again, I'll speak for myself, why I choose to wear hijab. I feel like it's this constant reminder how do I say it? It's this constant reminder to be the best that person I could be, if that makes sense. Not because the hijabs the hijab makes me a good person. The hijab doesn't make me a good person. For me it's just a, it's this visual reminder. So wearing hijab reminds me to pray. Wearing hijab reminds me to um, not give people attitude sometimes, you know, when I'm frustrated. Wearing hijab reminds me to, um, but trust me, there are times where I still give people attitude. Right? Wearing hijab, you know, reminds me to, um, to be respectful, to be mindful, to be, it, it's just for me personally, it's a reminder, and it, it makes me feel closer to God. But that's, t again, to me. Um, a lot of people will tell you, well, I do it because of modesty. Quite honestly, you know, modesty can be defined in many different ways. I don't think hijab, a cloth on your head, automatically makes you modest. I think your behaviors and your inner inner self is, is very important to be worked on. Like, we have to work on ourselves internally. We have to work on our, our what our parents call akhlaq, like your, you know, your, your manners, your, your, the way you respond to your parents, the way you talk, the way you, those things are so important. And work on our fundamentals, like how many of us may do certain things but we don't pray like maybe we eat zabiha but we don't pray or we wear hijab but we don't pray or we you know um wear hijab and we're very nasty with our parents and we talk back and we're horrible to our parents or wear hijab but but you know people come up to us and we tell them why are you talking to me i don't care blah 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 i'm not going to tell you what islam is like what just because i'm wearing a scarf on my head like you know there this is this is this is the reality right so I'm not saying, oh, everyone should now like not wear hijab. No, I'm saying make sure that your internal, you're constantly working on your internal as you're working on your external, if that makes sense. And it is, it's a visual symbol. At the end of the day, it's a visual symbol that you are Muslim because you don't see people wearing hijab and long sleeves in Miami, Florida on a 100 degree weather day and they're just doing it for fashion sense. So it takes it takes a lot to do it. I don't care what anyone says. And for people to say, sister, I relate to you. No, you don't. <laughs> you do not relate to what it takes to wear hijab. It is very challenging. It is not easy. And anyone who says it's easy is kind of tr you know tricking themselves out. It's not easy. It takes a lot to wake up every morning and say, I'm gonna you know. Forget about having to match everything. That's a whole other st story. But it just takes a lot physically to like know that you have to, to do it. And and most girls who wear hijab will go through or have gone through a phase where they've thought about taking it off. And some have actually done it, and some haven't. And so it's a per it's a very personal thing. And I don't think it ever um, should be judged, or it should never be judged by anyone else. Is basically what I'll say. Okay, so... Remind me your name again? George. Mike. Michael. <laughs> George. <laughs> long sleeves. I was, I was wondering. Okay, like, do you, do you have to wear long sleeves if you're a woman? 
can't you wear can't you wear something like right here? Like why what is it a big deal? Okay. Is it is it a, like is it a religious context that says that you must wear keep your arms covered? You know, like because you can be like you said, it isn't it's not about like I mean, you can be modest, mm -hmm. you know, not show anything or whatever, but still have like trust. So it's not right. Right. So again, with that, there's different different like interpretations. Um, I personally follow the interpretation that that uh, and that this comes from like teachings of the prophet and stories of the prophet and things along those lines. So this is where we get it. These concepts because in the Quran, the ayah that's there regarding hijab, uh, unfortunately, it's it it doesn't tell you specifically like where you're you know up to, where long sleeves. It says. Um, and, and put a garment over your chest because the practice during those days that women would bear their chest. This was a common practice in the in this like these Arab tribes at the time. It was very normal. Like nudity was totally okay. I don't know what was going on then. But so the, the so what the ayah came down and it said so bring down your garments and cover your chest. So that's what came down. Um, there are different um, there are different verse there are different um, prophetic teachings, however, that teach you that you're supposed to like you know wear long sleeves and, and cover and be modest. And this is you know and, and keep in mind like the the style part that all came out through culture. Like people didn't wear this back in the prophet's days, right? Like you know they didn't wear dresses from Express and cardigans and they didn't layer. And you know these are the things that you know Muslim American girls go through now. Um, so. So, um, but then there, but again, like that's, that those are, those are, um, again, this is from the best of my knowledge, I'm not a scholar, but those are from, from prophetic teachings. And so some people buy into it and some people are not com completely convinced by them. So it's important to recognize that as well. And unlike Christianity, like Christianity, you have these images of Mary that's con like that they're, con like she's constantly you know, her hair is covered, she's dressed very modestly. Islam doesn't have these, like, we don't have these images. So there isn't a vi visual, like, oh, this is how Khadija dressed, this is how Aisha dressed, like, these are, you know, women in Islam. So, you, you really have, you're very dependent on what's in the Quran, what's in the prophetic teachings. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions or comments? We can keep this conversation going. I'm enjoying it. I don't know about you guys. The guys are kind of falling asleep. I can understand that. You probably hear these conversations all the time. Like, God, hijab. Um, go ahead. Sorry. No. Like, if y'all want me to shut up, just say something. No, you should go. So, I don't know if anyone else is thinking it, but I'm thinking it. Like, and I mean, I know the answer or whatever, kind of sort of, but I just kind of want to, like, put it out there. So, something that. Um, someone said to me once before, it's like, oh, well, you know, the Muslim girls, they don't have any fun. They just, they're just like boring or whatever. I'm like, no, they, they go out, go bowling and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, they go swimming, they do have fun time, mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. whatever. So, like, could you, as a woman who was a Muslim, mm -hmm. who wears a hijab and is covering everything, mm -hmm. could you like, just so you want to tell me what my, you want me to tell you what my hobbies are basically what I do on my free time okay so I'm probably not the best no. no I didn't have one of those stories um so um so for I mean I think we're like every other girl we like to shop um I think that's probably where most girls spend their time um but no on a serious note though um I mean it's it Basically, as long as it doesn't involve alcohol and clubbing till two o'clock in the morning, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're in a safe zone. Um, I think it's important for like us to recognize boundaries as well. Um, I personally practice certain boundaries, especially as a, like a young Muslim who lives like I'm not under the roof of my family. I'm living on my own, so I'm obviously making decisions. And I'm assuming all of you guys are not living at home by living by going to school here, so you actively have to make decisions that are good decisions so you know you don't put yourself in compromising situations like you know being in a guy's dorm till a certain time you know it, these aren't I'm not saying that these are not things that are laid out in the Quran so let me clarify that but these are based on teachings you kind of you Take those teachings and you put it into context in 2012. What are the fun things to do these days? Back in the Prophet's days, they didn't have 
clubs, right? But they had things that were equivalent to it, right? So they didn't have bars, but they definitely had alcohol. And so even like there was an ayah or the, the verse when it came down um, forbidding alcohol in Islam, it's, they said it was like a river from how much alcohol that was because alcohol there was because alcohol was such a common part of the culture. So it was like a river of alcohol because they all, I'm sorry, let me clarify, they all like dumped their alcohol basically. So um, when, the, when the verse was brought down forbidding alcohol. So I don't know what that has to do with hijab and what girls like to do. But anyways, um, so I mean, I think we do the, you know, anything that again, that doesn't include alcohol, that doesn't include being put in compromising situations, that doesn't include premarital sex, that doesn't include, you know, doing things that are inappropriate. And you know those things, right? Like, you know those, like, m most of our parents teach us that from, from childhood anyways, right? Like, we're not ever, I was never allowed to sleep over friends' houses if they had brothers. Like, that was just a common practice. That had, didn't necessarily have to do with Islam, but that had to do with cultural, like, you know, cultural mentality or things like that. Um, so, the mall, like you said, pool parties, but it's like... I mean, I would wear pants and sneakers, yeah, but yeah, I would, I would, I would do that. Um, I'm not really good at it, so I don't really play sports, but I'll watch basketball. Um, oh, I'm from Florida, so Miami Heat. I know everyone hates on us, but we won the championship last year. Um, so, I mean, it's just what average people do. I mean, I like to go to networking events in D.C. Um, I like to go to lectures. I like to go to, you know, carnivals, theme parks, you know, anything and everything, as long as it's just within the boundaries. Mm -hmm. What was that? So, I mean, there's, I mean, okay, so what's really cool about the Middle East is that there are a lot of women's only beaches, which is really, um, which is great. But since we don't have that luxury here, um, some community centers will like rent out a swimming like facility and do a girls day. Um, people have pools in their houses, so they'll do it. In terms of the beaches, we have something called, which I'm not a fan of the name, but it's called burkini, uh, which is stupid because, sorry for using that word, but because it goes back to the concept of burqa and hijab is not burqa, there's a distinguished difference between that. Burqa is an, like it's an Afghan traditional uh, like attire. That's not practiced in the rest of the world. Um, but it's just basically a material of what a bathing suit would be and it has its like, you know, cap or scarf and its long sleeves and sometimes it will have like a jumper dress on top of it so that it's loose. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, I think we're we're out of time. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you for the uh, a very interesting talk. Uh, I forgot to announce something. So today's actually wear a hijab day, and if you guys saw us on the, uh, today's wear a hijab day, and if you saw us on the quad today, we were handing out free uh, hijabs basically. And so a bunch of the girls have been wearing them for the first time ever today. And so we're, uh, gonna ha we're having a discussion in a few minutes, actually. Um, uh, and they'll basically be sharing their experiences, what it felt like to wear the hijab. Um, and that's in the Women's Resource Center at 8.30, so in seven minutes. So we'll let you go soon. But uh, in, for those of you who don't know, it's on the intersection of Green and Wright, um, on the second floor of, of like, above Coco Mero, I think. Um, so everyone is inc encouraged to go. It's a very informal uh, discussion, and they'll be sharing their experiences. Uh, you know, most of them are not Muslim, so it should be very interesting. And uh, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the talk.